Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and I'm the director of the CSFI, the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. This is my 20th, I think, weekly economic overview since the coronavirus hit us, uh, and since our leaders compounded what was obviously a health crisis by exacerbating an economic crisis, the like of which we haven't seen since the 1930s. Is that too tough on Mr. Johnson and his friends? I really don't think so. I spoke last week with Andrew Oswald, a distinguished economist at Warwick, who broadly shares my views. And he pointed out that what ought to be blindingly obvious, that COVID-19 is a disease of the elderly and of those with pre-existing health conditions, but that the key is age. For those under 50, the risk is pretty trivial. Yes, there'll always be outliers, as there are with winter flu, but it's irrational to make policy on the basis of those outliers, particularly given the collateral damage that an economic shutdown does in terms of deaths from despair, deaths from deprivation, and deaths from that peculiarly British disease, not wanting to trouble the doctor when he or she is working so hard. Oh well, I've made these points before and have been roundly chastised by for them. Nevertheless, I'll make them again. At the very least, as Professor Oswald suggested, could we please have a couple of economists on the SAGE panel of so-called experts that currently seems bent on reimposing lockdown nationwide and on stopping any serious attempt to get workers back to their offices or back to their factories? That said, I accept that the resurgence of coronavirus cases in the United States has indeed undermined economic recovery, and that in Europe there is also signs that the dreaded second wave may be upon us. But there's also some good news. In Sweden, for instance, coronavirus-related deaths are now down to one or two a day, and the general feeling is that the government's much lighter touch approach has been vindicated, as we may well see this week when Swedish GDP data is released. Well, what else is there to talk about this week? Well, let me begin with the US presidential election. Was President Trump really serious when he used Twitter on Wednesday night to float the idea of postponing the November elections on the grounds that the greater use of postal voting would produce the most, and I quote, inaccurate and fraudulent election in American history? Well, maybe, after all, anyone who has lived and voted in Tower Hamlets, as indeed I have, knows that postal voting can be abused, even if the US media has been unanimous in condemning Trump, as always, for his presumed ignorance. The problem is that postal voting abuses tend to be most egregious in immigrant communities where a patriarchal male oversees the votes of the other members of the household. And those communities are, in the US at least, overwhelmingly democratic. Or maybe he wasn't so serious. Maybe Trump was just venting, frustrated as he must be that his message isn't getting through and that his enemies in the media are winning the battle. And they are winning. A couple of weeks ago, Rasmussen, a perfectly respectable polling organization, had Biden ahead by only two points. Now it has him ahead by six points. And all the other pollsters have Trump trailing by anywhere up to 15 points. Plus, he's behind in every single battleground state that he has to win if he's to overcome the natural demographic advantage that the Democrats have. Whatever, Trump was quickly disabused. The president does not have the power to postpone an election, and neither Republicans nor Democrats in Congress are minded to give him that satisfaction. Since Trump is not stupid, I imagine that was no surprise to him, which leaves two possibilities. First, that he was trying to delegitimize the election result in advance, just in case a democratic sweep means that his enemies really do try to put him and his family in the slammer for abuse of office or for corruption. Or second, 
that he's so completely fed up with the hammering he's taking in the press and elsewhere that he is seriously considering quitting the race, even at this very late stage. Now, I'm not quite predicting the latter, at least not yet, but I was looking at a couple of US betting sites last week and I saw the prices that were being offered for both Mike Pence and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as the next US president, which struck me as interesting. At 50 to one, either may be worth the punt. Still, I accept that that's not likely. At the moment, at least, Trump seems much more likely to go down fighting, even if that means taking the Republican majority in the Senate down with him. So what can he do? Well, he can pick a fight with China. And there have been reports over the weekend that he may do just that, dumping on TikTok in particular and other social media platforms for allegedly channeling personal data on American consumers back to Beijing. The problem with that is twofold. First, even though China is, as I have said, extremely vulnerable because of its dependence on trade as the engine for growth, it can cause almost immediate havoc in the US tech space by restricting US firms access to the rare earths that China almost alone produces. And second, it risks Trump getting into a pissing contest with Biden, since the Democrats who are dependent on the AFL-CIO for getting the blue collar vote out are at least as protectionist as the White House is, and even more anti-China. What else? Trump can also continue to do what he has been doing, wrapping himself in the flag and presenting himself as the law and order candidate who will fight for good old American values against the anarchy of the Antifa and Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it worked for Nixon. It may work for Trump. But as I keep saying, I am astonished at how far to the left the political center of gravity in the US has shifted. In the end, I think Trump has no option but to hope that Biden makes a mistake, either a verbal gaffe that even the overwhelmingly partisan press cannot ignore, or a vice presidential choice that scares the pants off middle America. On the latter score, we are promised news this week. Remember, Biden has already pledged to announce a, a female as his running mate. And remember also that Representative Jim Clyburn, who saved his bacon in South Carolina, is demanding a black woman, or at least a woman of color. As of now, therefore, the favorites are, favorites are probably, first of all, Senator Kamala Harris, half Jamaican, half Indian, very ambitious, not a team player, and seriously deficient on the international side. Second, Susan Rice, a former ambassador to the UN and national security advisor to Obama. Nice, safe pair of hands, but deeply deficient on the domestic side. Third in line is possibly Representative Karen Bass, a 66-year-old latecomer to the race who was being bigged up over the weekend, particularly, I think, in the UK press, who but who has said some very silly things about Cuba, and I can't take her really seriously. There's also Senator Tammy Duckworth, half Thai Chinese and a double amputee. There's even Elizabeth Warren. Probably the best bet, at least in my opinion, because she wouldn't scare the middle classes, is Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. But that wouldn't go down well with Clyburn. As far as Biden's policy initiatives are concerned, I've all already pointed out that one that really ought to scare the markets. That is his pledge to expand the Fed's mandate from a dual obligation to promote low inflation and full employment to a triple whammy, adding a commitment to promote racial diversity. I can just see the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, taking a knee before its next meeting. My guess is that this was one of the factors behind what has been an astonishingly rapid turnaround of sentiment on the dollar.
which lost 4% on a trade-weighted basis during the month of July, and which lost another 2% or so against most currencies last week. The politicization of the Fed is a really scary prospect. However, most analysts have uh, preferred to focus on Trump's own tweets on the resurgence of the coronavirus in the South and Southwest and on the policies by both being followed by both the Treasury and the Fed, which they believe are leading to the, quote, debasement of the dollar as a reserve asset. Oh. And also there are studies suggesting that in any case, the dollar is 5 to 10% overvalued on a PPP, purchasing power parity basis. So maybe this was, this was in line anyway. Still, the more we learn about Biden's likely economic program, from his green energy plan to his insistence on new Buy American procurement rules to his plans to politicize the Fed, markets are likely to get a little bit more nervous, especially if his coattails are strong enough to lead to a democratic sweep in Congress. So what of the global economy? Well, it wasn't a particularly good week. In particular, it was reported, first of all, that US GDP fell 9.5% in the second quarter, which amounted to an annualized rate of 32.9%, the biggest quarterly drop since the Great Depression, and according to the New York Times, quote, the most devastating on record. But things were even worse in Europe, with German GDP down 10.1% in the quarter, French GDP down 13.8%, Italian GDP down 12.4%, and Spanish GDP down a massive 18.5%. In addition, in the US, it was reported that personal spending fell at an annual rate of almost 35% in the second quarter, and that personal incomes fell another 1.1% in June. In Europe, it was also reported that the Consumer Confidence Index deteriorated in July from, uh, and, and that the unemployment rate increased in June from 77 to 7.8%. There's a bit more optimism here in the UK, where retail sales were up 13.9% in June, almost twice what the markets had expected, and where the CBI's Distributive Trades Index actually recovered in July from minus 37 to plus 4. But almost everywhere, and this is important, real-time economic data, card spending, restaurant reservations, and so on, is warning that the recovery may almost, may already have peaked. That's also the message from US jobless data, first-time unemployment claims, which are more or less a real-time indicator, were up 1.43 million in the latest up from 1.42 million the previous week and the third straight increase. Despite that, despite what the Bank of England's Andy Haldane has been saying, that makes perfect sense to me. On both sides of the Atlantic, furlough programs and extraordinary unemployment compensation schemes are coming to an end. And here in the UK, we are pretty much bound to see a surge in evictions when the current ban on evictions expires in less than three weeks. So what can governments do? Here in the UK, the focus is on extending the furlough schemes, though it was also recognised that the generosity of those schemes is actually acting as a disincentive that's stopping some people at least going back to work. In the EU, the focus is on the still on the 750 billion euro recovery and resilience fund, though for the moment that's still working its way through the various national parliaments who have to approve it. And that might not be automatic given Macron's, French President Macron's latest and unwanted intervention, suggesting that disbursements under the fund should be tied to rule of law issues like LGBT 
rights um, and religious freedom, a debate that most people thought had been put to rest at last month's European Council meeting. As for the US, the Fed has basically thrown its hands in the air and said there's nothing more that it can do. Though after last week's FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee meeting, Jay Powell did emphasize that the Fed is, and I quote, not even thinking about thinking about thinking about raising interest rates, which will therefore remain close to zero or even negative in real terms. So the onus almost everywhere is on the fiscal side. However, Congressional efforts in the US to produce another fiscal package before the summer recess have so far been thwarted, though both sides are agreed that something is needed. Last Monday, for instance, the Republicans produced their own bill, which involves additional spending of around $1 trillion, including $29 billion for completely unnecessary new fighter jets and $1.75 billion for an equally unnecessary new FBI building. It would also cut the over generous, admittedly, $600 a week furlough payment to $200 a week and then phase it out completely. The Democrats immediately counted with a $3 trillion package of their own, including about $900 billion in extra funding for state and local governments, which is anathema to Republicans who see it quite, quite rightly probably as a boondoggle for spendthrift democratic bureaucracies. So, stalemate. Plus, the White House and Congressional Republicans are also at odds over the latter's demand that any bill should provide some kind of legal protection for US uh, businesses that risk being sued if workers catch COVID-19 when they do eventually go back to work. That sounds perfectly sensible to me, but the White House apparently feels that it would be very difficult to push through and doesn't want it. So double stalemate. The result of all that really ought to have been an equity sell-off. And indeed, European markets were down 3 to 4% last week, while the, the Nikkei 225 in Japan was down 4.6%. However, the weaker dollar actually gave US markets a boost. Even though the Dow was off a minuscule 0.2% for the week, the S&P was up 1.7%, and NASDAQ was up an amazing 3.7%. The astonishing resilience of the tech-heavy NASDAQ index reflects, first of all, blockbuster quarterly earnings from the major tech firms, but it also reflects the sense that the big four tech titans who were forced to testify last week uh, before the House Judiciary Committee's subcommittee on antitrust basically dodged the bullet. True. Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg had a tough time, particularly over the Instagram deal. And true, this was only the first round of what is likely to be a long, drawn-out battle. But Tim Cook, Jeff Bezos, and Sundar Pichai all walked away from DC, well, from the video link to DC, more or less unscathed. The press have been geared up for the kind of hearings that broke big tobacco in the 1980s and that ended up splitting AT&T well before that, but it didn't happen. Despite accusations from the subcommittee chairman, Cicciolone, that their predatory behavior, and I quote, discourages entrepreneurship, destroys jobs, hikes costs, and degrades quality. Quite an indictment. Tough words but not much follow through. As for this week, well, three things to watch for. First of all, the final PMIs, the Purchasing Managers Indices for July, though it's worth emphasizing again that uh, though they embody, they do indeed embody expectations, they are still essentially backward looking. Second, the Swedish GDP number, which if it's significantly better than say, France or Italy will vindicate the government's light touch policy. And third, US non farm payrolls for July, which could see a drop of anything up to 15 million. 
Here in the UK, the Bank of England's MPC Monetary Policy Committee meets, but it is most unlikely uh, to change to announce any changes in monetary policy. As elsewhere, the burden of ensuring recovery is now firmly with the fiscal authorities. On that note, until next week, many thanks for watching. <laughs>